Good morning, people. <laughs> Seth asked me to uh, relate a story that I told him. Um, it's got a few elements in it, so if you would uh, bear with me. Uh, I'm trying to get them all in my order, in my head right now as we go along. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Amen. Okay. Uh, back in 2006, I lost my wife. Uh, she went home to be with the Lord. And uh, the next Easter, 2007, um, some friends were uh, caring for me and, and concerned about me, as, as a lot of you were, and I thank you all for that. Um, and they decided that uh, a good thing for me to do would be to go to Las Vegas, uh, where I spent 10 years of my life anyway. But I was going back uh, to see the show, the Cirque du Soleil show, Love, which was a, a Beatles um, tribute show. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a great show. Um, anyway, uh, so I said, okay, we went to the show, and a friend of mine uh, met us there, and we went to the show, and uh, I got a, a ride with this friend uh, back to McCarran Airport because this was Easter weekend. And so I was um, obliged to be here to uh, participate in the service. You know, I couldn't very well take Easter weekend off. <laughs> so uh, I caught uh, a flight uh, from McCarran uh, to Ontario, which arrived at one in the morning and then, uh, and so on and so forth. But anyway, uh, I got, to McCarran uh, a little ahead of schedule, so I decided to wait uh, in the bar and maybe catch some, some TV or whatever. As I was walking into the bar, uh, there was a, a man that followed not too close, but not too far behind. And I was a little put off, but I, I was okay because there were a few people in, in the airport still. So anyway, I went in and I sat down and this guy sat right next to me. And there were plenty of other seats at the bar. And uh, he asked me how I was doing. I said, okay. He said, how are you? He said, I'm not doing so good. I said, really? Uh, and he said, no, I'm not. He said, are you a pastor? And I said, no. I said, I'm involved in my church. And I know of a couple of pastors, but I'm not a pastor myself. He said, well, you, you look like a pastor. <laughs> and I remember thinking, this was the first time anybody's ever said that to me. <laughs> so uh, I said, well, why do you need a pastor? He said, well, I'm just doing terrible. I'm just no good. And I said, well, why are you no good? And he said, well, um, I just feel terrible. I said, I got out of prison not too long ago, and I got home to find out my wife was unfaithful to me. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, man. He said, so rather than go back to prison by doing her any harm, I decided I would just leave. But in leaving, I'm leaving my kids behind. So I'm on my way to Chicago, and I don't know if it's the right thing to do, but I have a sister that lives there. And uh, I just don't know. I said, I just feel terrible. I'm no good. I, I, my life is just messed up. So I remember thinking to myself, okay, this is one of those Moses moments for me. Um, I know you sent me here to, to be with this guy, but I can't, I, I don't know if I can do it. Uh, I don't know if I'll say the right thing or do the right thing. So I said a quick prayer. And then I asked him, well, let me ask you something. Do you know God? And he said, yeah, I think so. I said, well, do you know Jesus? And he said, I, I, I believe so. I think so. I said, well, do you know that Jesus loves you no matter what you've done in your life? He said, you can claim to be no good, but he accepts you just as you are. I said, he accepts me just as I am, and, and I'm no angel. But I, 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 
uh, feel Jesus' love. And I know that he loves me. And he loves you too. And I said, and I'm inviting you now to feel that love in your heart. He says, well, how do I do that? And I said, well, uh, you now this is me getting out, trying to get out of the, you know, the Moses thing is kicking up in me. I said, well, now you, you find yourself a quiet place and you pray to God. And you ask him for forgiveness, and then you invite him into your heart. He said, I don't know how to do that. Okay, thanks, God. You threw me a curve there. <laughs> okay, so now I'm thinking, okay, we're in a bar. So what, what I, I said, well, okay, I've got to throw caution to the wind here. I said, this man needs help. So I turned to him and I said, would you like for me to pray with you right now? And he said, yeah, that would, be, that would be great. So I grabbed both of his hands and we bowed our heads right there in the middle of the bar in McCarran Airport with everybody staring at us and all. Uh, at that point, it didn't matter. This man's soul was at stake. So I prayed, probably as hard as I've ever prayed, uh, and I had asked him his name. His name was Alberto. And I said, Lord, we lift up your faithful servant, Alberto. Uh, we ask you to forgive him his sins and to come into his heart and let him feel the joy that you bring all of us. Knowing that salvation is waiting for him. And um, so anyway, at the end of the prayer, uh, I raised my head up, and he raised his head up, and I noticed tears streaming down his face and a big smile on his face. And that caused tears to well up in my eyes. And he said, Bart, he says, I believe I can make it now. He said, I really believe that. I said, I said, I know you can, brother. I know you can. And he said, uh, I have a question. He says, do you think they have churches in Chicago? <laughs> and I said, well, you go see your sister, and I'm sure your sister can find a church for you. And uh, you can visit that church and continue this journey. And I said, God bless you. And he said, You've been such a blessing to me. And I said, no, Alberto, you've been the blessing to me. Because I felt so welled up inside. I've never felt that kind of, of peace, uh, happiness, joy, to bring someone to know Christ like that. It was just amazing and when I left that bar to go catch my flight I didn't feel my feet moving because I felt like I was just floating it was just it was just an amazing feeling um, so I guess my point is push through the fear push through the doubt know that God is with you and the results will be amazing Thank you. Thank you, Bart. You know, as you were talking about your feet, you know, sort of you couldn't feel your feet. You were kind of floating along. I'm, I'm thinking you should also think about joining Circus de Soleil. You know? <laughs> Second career there. Well, just a, a quick word. Um, I've been asked to do a marriage conference next month for three churches, and it's going to be in Westminster. And if you are interested, there are some flyers that look like this out in the foyer. It's a Friday night and a Saturday till about 3 o'clock. And there are five topics, and they're on the back of this. So if you're interested, you can uh, check that out and, and register uh, with the folks who are putting this together. Well, there was a policeman that was going through uh, the police academy, a young guy, 
and he'd finished all his tests, and he was on his very last test. It was a verbal test. And the, uh, the sergeant asked this question. Supposing you were tasked with arresting your mother-in-law, what would you do? And without missing a beat, he said, call for backup. <laughs> That's a man with some experience with his mother-in-law. It also reminded me of another story of a... Um, in a small little town in Kansas back during the uh, 1800s, the old west days, and a new stranger came in on his horse, and he went to a saloon, and he, he got off and hitched the horse to the hitching post and went inside and went up to the, to the bar and or put his nickel down and said he wanted some cold beer. So what he didn't know was in that little town, the, the uh, locals had this habit of sort of playing tricks on the strangers in town, and so when he finished his beer, he walked back out the, out the saloon, out to the doors, and his horse was gone. Well, he was angry as a hornet. And he came busting back into the saloon, and he got everybody's attention with some loud noise, and he took out his gun, and he flung it up in the air. It was spinning around. He caught it without even looking at it, a couple shots into the ceiling, and he said, somebody took my horse. I don't care who it was but I'm gonna go up to the bar and get another beer. And by the time I'm done drinking that beer, that horse better be under that hitching post. And it got very quiet in there. He said, you don't want me to do what I had to done in Texas. I didn't like what I had to done in Texas. Don't wanna to have to done that again. It was very quiet. So he went up, put down his nickel, had another beer. And after several minutes, he put his beer down, and he walked across the saloon and out the doors, and voila, the horse was back on the hitching post. Well, the bartender was fascinated by this whole story, and, uh, and he followed the guy out, and uh, as the cowboy was getting back up on his horse, the, uh, the bartender said, you know, I've seen a lot of things in this saloon, but I've never seen anything like that before. He said, it made me wonder. What did you done in Texas that you didn't want to done here? Cowboy leaned back in his saddle, put the brim of his hat up, and he said, I had to walk home. <laughs> <laughs> well, the title of today's message is it's Clearing Up Relationships. And if you want this, the sermon in a sentence, it's this. When we mess up, we fess up. When you mess up, we fess up. We're doing a series called Our Heart Attitudes, Seven Heart Attitudes. You can get one of these cards out in the foyer to take home with you. These seven heart attitudes are the kind of things that help people build a marriage. They help you build a family. They help you build your work environment or a neighborhood or a group or a church. They help. And, and attitudes are sort of the things that this is how we relate. These are the things that we value. These are the things that we aspire to be and do. And the more that we can do those kinds of things, then the more relationships are built. And, but the opposite is also true. If we fail to do these seven hard attitudes, uh, then it, it has an effect on our marriage. It has an effect on our family uh, or your work environment or a church or a Bible study group. A lot of you know that I've been a lifelong baseball friend, uh, fan. And, um, and that has been slowly waning over the years for a number of different reasons that are sad to me. But one of the things that happened was the steroid era in baseball. And, um, and, and it was just crazy. Well, about 15 years ago, the Mitchell Report came out uh, and, and had done an extensive study on this steroid issue and found out there were over 90 players that had tested positive for steroids. And it just sent shock waves uh, through the baseball world. Now, one of the things that was fascinating to me was that there were generally three different responses by those players that had been caught doing steroids. The first response was what you might think of as the lame excuse response. And this was that, that they blamed anything except something they had done wrong. The trainer put something different in, in their protein shake, or they had some prescription that they didn't know had some kind of ster steroid in it, or they had a, uh, at, the, at, the, at the team banquet, they, some, somebody had done something, or it was a lame sample, uh, it was, but something was wrong. Test was wrong, uh, lame excuse. And there were a lot of those. The second one was the apology that's not really an apology. 
It sounds like an apology. It's close to being an apology, but it's not really an apology. When I think of this, I always think of attorneys who make big bucks writing drivel like this. And so I remember one particular uh, player, uh, Jason Giambi, uh, had a press conference, and he was, he was sorry. He was sorry that, uh, that this had caused so much trouble for baseball. He was sorry that he had let down his Yankee teammates. He's sorry that he had let down his Yankee manager and, and the management. He's sorry that he had let down the fans. And he let down himself. But the, the, the thing that was so interesting about this press conference, he never used the word steroids, and he never admitted to taking steroids in his apology press conference. And the irony of this was that his grand jury testimony had been leaked where under oath, he had admitted to taking steroids. So you had the lame excuse, and then you had the apology that sounds like an apology, but re really isn't an apology. The third response is a very rare response. And that is that somebody actually takes ownership and responsibility for what they did. And, and this is a very small crew. Uh, the one I remember the most was a Yankee pitcher named Andy Pettit. And he came out and was talking about that he'd had an injury and the, the, was trying to heal from this injury. I think he was in his maybe mid-30s. It was taking forever to heal, and he thought that this might speed up the process. Um, but he tested positive, and he came clean with this. He fully embraced what he'd done publicly at a press conference, um, and, and everybody was shocked. However... Everybody also, for the most part, ran to his corner. At least some, it was so refreshing to hear somebody admit some kind of culpability in what they shouldn't have done. And he went on to, 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 have a, to finish his career um, as a Yankee. Um, Acts 24, 16, Paul says, I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. This is the peace of having a clear conscience. Now, that begs the question, what is a clear conscience? And the best definition of a clear conscience I like is, is this. The inner freedom from knowing no one can point a finger at you and accuse you of wrongdoings that you have not made right or at least tried to make right. In other words, all of us are going to make mistakes and there's going to be relationships that we, where we misunderstand somebody or we miscommunicate or we, 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 we overreact to something and we, we are harsh and, and sensitive. And each one of these things is like a brick. And this can be in a marriage or it can be with your teenagers or it can be at work. And if that particular break in relationship is not fixed, then that brick just stays there. And over time, another thing is going to happen, a miscommunication or a misunderstanding, a disagreement, and there are hurt feelings, and there's a second brick. And if we don't learn how to clear up each one of these things, over time, we are, we are slowly making walls between our spouse or our teenagers or people at church or people at work. The question is, how do you, how do you when one, each of these things happen, what do you do with this brick? That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, first of all, how not to gain a clear conscience. Uh, and the first one I always think of is, I was wrong, but you were too. Now, I think every husband has played that card in early in their marriage, and, and I believe I've played that card several times. And uh, that card is actually a letter bomb that's going to blow up in your face. Because though that actually may be true, the other person may not believe that's true like you believe it's true. And what you've set off now is you had one conflict before, and now you have two that you're trying to navigate together. All that matters here is what did I do, and how do I need to clear this up? The second way not to do this is the I'm sorry or I apologize. Uh, this, you see this on TV at press conferences all the time. I'm sorry. Now, if you're married... Uh, if you're a husband, your wife, if, if you try to play the I'm sorry or I apologize card, it's likely that her next question to you was, what are you sorry for? What are you sorry about? And be because 
uh, there, there's a sense in which clearing up relationship is not just a generality, but it's a specific thing. We're talking about a specific brick. So now sometimes people are sorry uh, because they were caught, or they were sorry because they're embarrassed, or they're sorry because of consequences that they have to experience, which, which is really is not a, an apology at all. Uh, the third one is what I think of as the quick apology. I also tried this in the first year of our marriage. Uh, we, we were having a conflict, and, and generally speaking, I was learning as a, as, a, as a newbie husband that when we had a conflict, a lot of these conflicts had to do with me. And I didn't always think that at, at the beginning, but every time we would sort of deal with the next brick that came along, there was sort of this sense in which, I know there's a brick there that I caused, but I don't see it yet, but I believe I'm going to see it pretty soon. I think she's going to tell me about the brick, uh, and, and that would happen. Now, I remember one time thinking, now this time, in this particular situation, I know I didn't do something wrong. And I was sitting there thinking, I got her this time. Not, not, I'm, I'm going to stand tall on this one. And, and the more that she talked, the more I could, I could tell that I had just waited, I was wading out into the ocean, and, and I was now in one of those waves that just sort of carries you out to sea. And I knew, I could tell, yep, once again, there was something I did wrong here, and I was going to have to listen and, and try to own this and learn from this. And, and I could tell that the, that the wave was catching speed. And, and I had this image that came to my mind of, Seth, you are going to be in the doghouse, and you are going to be eating puppy chow and lapping water from the bowl. And maybe you'll have a, a copy of Puppy Illustrated that you can watch. I, I remember this, this image coming to my mind as this was going on. And, um, and so, because I could see the handwriting on the wall, I blurted out, uh, I'm sorry, would you forgive me? Thinking, wrongly, that I had just solved our problem. And uh, she said, well, Seth, I heard the, right, I heard the words that you, are, that you are sorry for, and you asked me to for, forgive you, but I'm not sure I understand what you're asking forgiveness for. Oh. Now, that was a learning lesson for me. Because, because reconciliation doesn't happen unless somebody really owns what they've done. This is just how relationships work. So the quick apology... Throw that out. And then the, the fourth one, which may be the worst one. If I've been wrong, please forgive me. You hear this on TV a lot also. And the idea of this one is something like this. Most people, the vast majority of people would not be, have been offended by what I did. But somebody as insecure and insensitive as you, so, so weak-willed and, and weak emotion, somebody like you may have taken that sensitively. So if you did, I, I'm sorry for that. So, so that one is really not an apology at all, but it's sort of a back, uh, backstabbing accusation. Well, on the inside of your handout, there are some principles of a clear conscience. Number one, we're not right with God when we're wrong with people. It's easy to, as a Christian to think, well, you know, I'm right with God, and, and that's good enough. But, but John says in 1 John 4, 20, if anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. He who has given us his command, he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So, just because I think that, that I'm right with God and I'm doing well, does, um, it, but if I have a broken relationship or something that needs reconciled, uh, my relationship with God, I may claim to have a really good relationship, but at this moment, not so much. All right, and then 1 Peter 3, 7 is one of those things that uh, should sort of shake all of us husbands up at different times, and it's shaken me up at times. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Now, there, there, there are different verses about husbands and how we're supposed to relate to our wives, but this is the only one I know where it says, husbands, this is so important that if you don't do better in this and keep improving in this, 
I'm going to reach down out of heaven. And when you have some prayers that you have, uh, that you think are important to you, I'm going to, I'm going to put a ceiling on those prayers. Now, I, have, I believe that personally, and with some of my friends in the years we've been out here um, with our church, that God has gotten a hold of us, sometimes me, sometimes other men, where you've been harsh and sort of justified that. And God just reaches down into your business or your checkbook and just turns the spigot off. No, 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 no. Sales. <laughs> business. <laughs> Bills. <laughs> I remember one time we had several different appliances uh, fail at the same time. They were quite expensive when we were much younger and, uh, and very poor. And I remember thinking about this verse, and I'm thinking, God, are you trying to tell me something about how I'm relating to Mindy here? Uh, and there are times where I believe he has. We're not right with God when we're wrong with people. Number two, the past is not past until you're reconciled. Uh, I have talked with a number of women who have been sexually abused uh, when they were girls, and it's horrible. And, and the effect of this lasts for a very long, long time. And there have been some perpetrators, usually it's a father or an uncle, who years and years later, uh, after this woman is an adult, who want to come back into relationship, and, um, and yet they've never asked forgiveness or even admitted what they've done. And they have played this card with their daughter or niece. Well, you're a Christian, and shouldn't you forgive? As if that's, that's, it's on her to do that. Well, that's not how forgiveness works. That's not how reconciliation works. Forgiveness involves an admission of guilt born of authentic responsibility. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins to God, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, we are forgiven when we do the confession part. And that Greek word to confess just means simply to agree with God about what I did wrong. Then forgiveness is promised. Now, the same principle is true in relationships. If somebody plays the card, or if you play the card, well, you should just forgive me. The question is, did somebody, did somebody confess or agree that what they did was wrong? And so there have been women who, who the father or uncle played this card. You should just forgive me. And, and when they ask, for what? And if they are not honest about what they did, then forgiveness cannot be granted. And relationship cannot be restored until somebody makes an admission of their guilt. Pretending it didn't happen is neither forgiveness nor being reconciled. The third principle, relationship takes priority over worship. There are very few things in life as important as worship. Every Sunday when we worship, we are sort of, God is recalibrating our soul, our heart, to put him at the top of the totem pole in our heart. During the week, we sort of drop him down and we put other people at the top, a husband, a wife, our kids, our work, finances, health, all kinds of things go up there. And on Sunday, we kind of go, wait a second, something's messed up here. But as important as worship is, Jesus says there's something more important than that. And he, and he records this in, this is recorded in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 23 and 24. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember your brother has something against you, you're in worship, and suddenly you think about somebody has something against you. You did something wrong. Relationship is not, is not restored. There's a, there's a brick there. Leave your gift at the altar and uh, first go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Now, there have been times uh, when, when our kids were little where I would be sitting here and we would be singing songs and, and I'd be thinking about the message and things. And while we're singing songs, I'm sitting there thinking that I had been harsh with one or more of my kids that morning. I don't know about you, but is there something true about Sunday morning that Satan just loves to get into your household and stir the hornet's nest? 
just a mess. You get in the car and you're just fuming, you know, and you, just, you nobody's saying a word to anybody. You're just, you're just on the edge. And then you get out of the car and walk in the, hey, it's good to be here today, you know, kind of thing. And I'm sitting over here thinking, oh, Seth, you were, you were harsh with your kids. We're singing the songs. What do you do? Well, according to what Jesus says, you get up, you walk down that hallway, you find your kids' classrooms, and you say, hey, Brittany, Cole, Christy, come over here. Daddy was harsh with you. Would you forgive him for being harsh with you today? There have been times when Mindy was teaching a class over here, and I had to go ask her forgiveness while she was teaching the class. This is what he says here. This, is, this, this takes priority, is the idea. And number four, the initiative lies with you. Now, oftentimes, uh, especially early in a marriage, it's very easy for uh, both people in, a, in the couple to say, to think, why do I always have to be the first one to apologize? I'm so tired of being the first one to apologize. I remember talking to a woman who'd been married for about 10 years, and, uh, and, and she was dumbfounded by this. I see we have some personal examples here, too. <laughs> so we, <laughs> uh, and and, and she, said, she said to me one day, she said, you know, it's the strangest thing. We've been married for 10 years. And every time we have a conflict, he's never done anything wrong in his mind. But he's sure that I, that, that I was responsible for every conflict. And I remember thinking, oh, isn't that just lovely to live in that situation? Uh, well, the initiative lies with you. Does it matter who goes first? Well, according to Jesus, it doesn't matter. The answer is you go first. You take the initiative. So when I think about this, I think about a funny story between broken relationships and taking the initiative of a couple that retired and they had wanted to go on a safari for years. And so they went to that. And at the last minute, the wife said, can my mother go with us? I want my mother to go and experience this. And the husband was going, oh, no. Oh, no. And, and so he kind of felt trapped. And he, he agreed to it. Yeah, she can come. And so they, they flew to Africa. And they were on this safari deep in the jungle. And, uh, and it was dangerous around there. And one morning, the wife woke up just about dawn. And she looked over. And on the cot, her mother was gone. And she freaked out. She got up and she walked outside and looking around, peering through the jungle. She didn't find her mother anywhere. And she came running in, horrified. She woke up her husband. My mother's out there in lion country by herself. You've got to get up. We've got to find her. And so he woke up and he went over and got his high-powered rifle. And, and they're walking out through the jungle looking. And when they come to a clearing, the wife looks across the, the, the clearing. And the mother-in-law is backed up against a large boulder, frozen. And there's a lion right in front of her. And the mother says, what are you going to do? What are you going to do to the husband? He says, I'm not going to do anything. She says, what do you mean you're not going to do anything? He said, the lion got himself in this trouble. It's up to the lion to get himself out of it. <laughs> if you're offering your gift at the altar, there remember your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, Go. Somebody has something against you. Who's responsible? Me. I go. Then he says in Matthew 18, if your brother sins against you, somebody else did something to you. Roles are reversed here. Go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. In other words, if you find a brick there, it doesn't matter who put the brick there. And it doesn't matter if you think you're responsible for the brick or, more res or less responsible, you have a responsibility to, to deal with the brick as best as you can. Now, with one important warning, and that is, if every time there's a brick there and you virtually all the time think somebody else put that there and you go to confront them every time that brick is there, after a while, you're not going to have very many friends. Nobody likes to be continually rebuked and confronted and critiqued about what they did. So, and as our culture says, you have to pick your mountains sometimes. And there's a lot of things that fall under the category of you're going to have to forgive somebody without making this an issue. This is an important tool in terms of relationships. 1 Peter 4.8 
Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. I would guess 99 out of 100 times when you, when somebody's done something to you and you feel put out or you feel offended or 99 out of 100 times God is saying to you, you're, you're going you're gonna to deal with this. Now, there are times where it just bothers you and it bothers you for a whole day and another day and another day and another day and you can tell it's affecting you and now it's affecting the relationship. There are times where you are going to take the initiative and talk about this brick. But you have to use some, some wisdom and some prudence here. And then number five, do what you can to reconcile. There are times when a, reconcil- a, a relationship is broken and you've tried to do the best you can to reconcile and it's just not going to happen. Sometimes this is reality. Now, even the great apostle of Paul and uh, his sidekick Barnabas had a big disagreement about who was going to go on, their, on the next mission trip. And they, and they couldn't agree on it. And, and, and there was a sharp division between them, as the Greek says. They just could not agree on this, even to the point of being able to go out on the next trip together as partners. Sometimes this happens. But, and so what do you do? Well, Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, as far as... As it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So there are times you're going to try to reconcile, and the person is not just going to, is just not going to have it. And sometimes that's how it is. And so your response is going to be, I'm sorry. I have a very good friend of mine who um, is, uh, he's, he's kind of one of my heroes. Yeah, doesn't go to our church. Um, and he has been generally in a very rough marriage. And um, not too, not too uh, long ago, uh, his wife is going through several different large issues in her life unrelated to marriage, uh, was really upset, and she looked at him and she said, I will never respect you. Now, I can't imagine a wife saying anything worse to her husband than that. Or that strikes at the heart of a husband more than that. I would rather a wife say, I don't love you anymore and I found somebody else. Now, to to my friend's credit, now what does he do on this reconciled relationship? Well, he's been around the block with his wife a number of times on this and there there is no point in saying something about her in this. This, is, this falls under the, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. There's nothing he was going to say that was going to win that situ- or be redemptive in that situation. Other than what he could do himself. And to his credit, he looked at her with some sadness in his eyes. And he said, that's okay. In other words, he's not Humpty Dumpty. He's not going to fall apart because she just said some wicked, evil thing to him. But at the same time, he is still going, he still wants to be connected with her. This is the verse, 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, love each other deeply. Proverbs 18, 2 says, A fool finds no pleasure in understanding, but delights in Aries' own, own opinion. On the back of your handout, how to gain a clear conscience. There are three things that, uh, that just putting the cookies on the bottom shelf here. Uh, does someone hold something against me I need to clear up? Sometimes yeah, you pray that prayer and you ask God to show you. Uh, other times you sort of sense this. Um, and if you're not sure, then, then th- this is verbiage I like. I may be being overly sensitive here. Is there something I've done to offend you? you know, may- maybe not, but is there something? Is there something we should talk about? Is there something that you, you should tell me? So sometimes when I ask that question, there is something. And it's helpful to the other person to verbalize it. And sometimes, oh, no, no, we're good. Okay. Number two, you think about what was the basic offense done against someone? And, and so these are some of my favorites. Uh, I was self-centered. I was harsh, ungrateful, critical, proud, disrespectful, unkind, uh, and stubborn. Uh, those, are, those are sort of the kind of com- common things, offenses. But you have to be careful how you word these things. For example, you, you can't say... 
Honey, would you forgive me for griping about your cooking? That's not a good apology. <laughs> Instead, it might be something like, Honey, you do so much for our family, and I've been ungrateful. Would you forgive me? That's a, that's a good apology. Or you can't say, you know, honey, I, I was wrong to argue with you. That's not an apology either. Um, that's sort of trying to cut a deal where you, you don't hurt as nearly as much. You're trying to finance something here. Um, but instead, you're going to say something like, you know, that when we were talking, I was just so stubborn. Uh, that was wrong. Would you forgive me? Uh, so that's the second, uh, the ba- what's the basic offense? And then, and then ask them to forgive you. I realized that I was stubborn. Or I realized I was harsh. That was my favorite thing to ask Mindy's forgiveness the first year of our marriage. Um, would you forgive me? Or I'd say, you know, I'd just ask God to forgive me. Would you forgive me for being harsh? Um, now, the, the last thing I want to say is sometimes God puts mirrors in our life. And a mirror is somebody that... Um, has similar, sort of relates to us the way we relate to other people. This this person has an effect on you that bothers you, or it irritates you, or it offends you. There's something just, you just don't like about this. And sometimes the question to ask is, God, have you put this person in my life to see what it's like to relate to me? Now, I have to tell you, without naming names, that that's not unusual. Sometimes this is how God makes us aware of blind spots in our life. And sometimes I've had to go back to people and ask them, thinking of one particular situation, um, have you felt criticized by me in our relationship? And there have been times where the answer is yes. Now, how did that question come up? The question come up because I got so tired of being criticized by a few different people, mirrors in my life, that I thought, huh, I prayed and asked for God to take away these mirrors, but God has not done that. Is there a reason why they're still here? And uh, the answer turned out to be yes. Let's pray together. Father, every one of us is going to mess up. And they're uh, just the raw material that we are as people. Um, We are self-centered, and this should be no surprise to us. Everywhere we go, I take me with me. And sometimes that's good, and sometimes not so good. But not if we mess up, but when we mess up, would you give us the humility and the love for somebody else and the value of our relationship to humble myself or to humble ourselves And just to to make a simple acknowledgement and agreement that what I did was wrong and the asking of forgiveness. Would you help us to see, maybe, maybe we have bricks lying all around us. Maybe some in our marriage, some with teenagers. Or maybe at work or with a boss or an employee or extended family member. Are there bricks to which I need to do something about as best as I can? Father, help us to uh, not be brick layers, but to brick throwers. Throwing them in the garbage dump. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.